Hello, I'm Jeff Vincent, Stanback Dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. I'd like to welcome you to the Nicholas School's first ever Facebook Live event. If you're joining us from the Midwest, where I grew up, or the Northeast, where I lived for some 20 years, we'll try to send some warmth your way. Mm -hmm. I know it's chilly there, but it was 68 and sunny here in the Research Triangle. <laughs> I wish we're meeting in person and enjoying our lovely early spring weather together, but I'm glad we're at least able to meet virtually. Our topic this evening is inspiring environmental leadership. Now more than ever, our country and our world need environmental leaders in all sectors, public, private, nonprofit. With your help, we'll have a lively conversation around how Nicholas School faculty, students, alumni, staff lead in the environmental, part, environmental space and how we work together to develop future environmental leaders. If you're not already part of the Nicholas School, we hope the conversation will help you understand why the world needs the graduates of our Master of Environmental Management and Master of Forestry programs and how we prepare students to meet those needs. Just a few days ago, scientists from NASA and NOAA announced that the Earth reached its highest temperature on record, mm -hmm. ever. Climate change isn't a hoax, it's here. As we continue to work on ways to mitigate climate change and address a myriad of other environmental problems, we all must work together. Democrats and Republicans, rural and urban communities, people of all races, ages, ethnicities, nationalities, religions, orientations, backgrounds, and beliefs. We need environmental leadership in all parts of society, not only the political realm. We need environmental professionals who not only understand the science, but who can affect change from the grassroots to the highest policy levels, and all the levels in between. Given the regime shift in Washington, it's quite possible that environmental leadership at the community and state levels and in the private sector will be especially important in years to come. The faculty, students, and alums of our school are doing some truly inspiring work at those levels, as well as nationally and in countries around the globe. We're very excited to dig into this topic with you tonight. Before we move to your questions, my colleagues and I would like to take a few minutes to introduce ourselves. Again, I'm Jeff Vincent. My professional work is entirely outside the US in developing countries, mostly in Asia. I'm an economist and I focus on natural resource policy issues, especially issues related to tropical forests. My teaching has focused on professional master's programs uh, for nearly 30 years. I love the desire that professional students bring into the classroom, uh, that desire to obtain knowledge and skills that they can put to use, and the difference they make after they graduate. I also co-chair the Nicholas School's Master of Forestry program, and I've been deeply engaged in executive education programs, that is, programs that target working professionals in countries around the world since the early 90s. I'll turn next to my colleague, Deb Gallagher. Hi, I'm Deb Gallagher. Um, I'm a, a professor of the practice of environmental policy at the Nicholas School. I've been at the Nicholas School for about 15 years now. For about 10 years, I led the, the Duke Environmental Leadership Program. And I have a particular interest and a scholarship in environmental leadership. So I'm really excited about talking to you all tonight about environmental leadership. My uh, teaching is in environmental policy and also at the intersection of business and policy. I teach sustainable business strategy and my research focuses on the intersection between business and public policy. I think about collaborations between businesses to influence public policy. Uh, and I also do some work in the area of environmental, environmental justice. So um, I, I think that it's important to consider uh, how many disciplines would come together to confront issues that we're facing, especially in the light of the regime change that Jeff talked about. And with that, I guess I'll turn it over to my Thanks. colleague. Uh, I'm Martin Doyle. I'm a professor of river science and policy here at the Nicholas School, and I also uh, direct the water resources management program here for the Masters of Environmental Management stu uh, students. Um, I work in the area of water. Uh, I'm a hydrologist by training, especially a river scientist, so I get inordinately interested in the way fluid mechanics and sediment moves around. Um, but beyond that, a lot of the uh, types of problems that I work in now are in the area of ecosystem restoration um, and the intersection with infrastructure. So one of the main topics that I worked on for about 10 years uh, was dam removal. So. Uh, why we might remove dams, what happens when we remove dams. And then more recently, I've been working on infrastructure finance. So actually, where does the money come from to finance uh, rehabilitation of infrastructure or rebuilding of infrastructure? And that's led me into, similar to how Deb's career has moved into 
the, the intersection of environment and business, my uh, research and my teaching has also moved in the intersection of environment and finance. And so I now work with intersections of investment bankers and environmental scientists, um, which is a really interesting space to be in, um, in the way that uh, environment is now being looked at as an opportunity for businesses and for investors rather than a liability. Uh, and after that, I'll turn it to the other end of the table. Thanks, Mark. Liz? Hi, my name is Liz Shapiro Garza, and I'm a professor of the practice here at the Nicholas School. I teach primarily in the Master's for Environmental Management program, which I know a lot of you are interested in. And um, my, I'm a human geographer, which means that I am human, no, <laughs> 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 which means that I look at the intersection of um, how people are interacting with their environment. Um, my research is primarily in Latin America, actually, but here at the Nicholas School, um, I focus primarily on uh, community-based environmental management. So I'm the director of a certificate program in community-based environmental management, and that's primarily for our Masters of Environmental Management students. I'm also the director for community engagement for the Duke University Superfunds uh, Research Center, uh, which is a Duke University-wide um, research center that focuses on environmental health issues, uh, primarily here in, in the United States, but actually worldwide as well. Um, so as you can imagine, <laughs> I am very interested in looking at how communities can um, manage their own environment and be empowered to do that. So I really do focus a lot, um, both in my teaching and my research, on how, um, how we can facilitate, how we as, as leaders can facilitate the process by which communities can be empowered to make decisions about their own environment and enact those decisions and uh, enforce those decisions and influence, have influence at multiple scales to decide what they want their environment to be. Um, and that's really, I think, a big focus here at the Nicholas School um, is uh, the recognition that environmental problems are also social problems and social justice program uh, problems. So uh, that's a lot of what my, my work here with students focuses on, and uh, I hope you'll decide to join us. Thanks, Liz. Dean? I'm Dean Urban. I'm a landscape ecologist by training, which means I'm interested in how very large pieces of real estate uh, function as ecosystems, so things to scale of national parks, national grasslands, um, national forests, big chunks. Um, I teach here, I've been here for over 20 years, I teach um, students mostly the technical skills they would need to use uh, to do landscape uh, conservation, lands, landscape management. And even though that involves a lot of, of really technical skills in geospatial analysis and modeling, what it comes down to is uh, it's much more pragmatic. So a landscape, one way to define the landscape is what you see when you look out your window. Yeah. And if, even if you have a really bold vision of what you think, for example, the triangle might need to look like what you'd like to see it look like in, in 10 to 20 years, how that's going to happen is, is one parcel at a time. And so training students here is essentially to train them to see that big vision, but to also see how to make it happen at, at a very piecewise uh, uh, level of, of action. And that means that I, now as a technical geek, spend a lot of time working in community-based environmental management. Um, environmental leadership at that level uh, can look kind of funny, it mostly means that you as a as one person in the room have a vision and you need to make that vision sound just simple and easy and logical <laughs> to everybody else, uh, which means usually for our students translating really complicated things to make them sound really simple and logical. And if you can do that, you can do amazing things mm -hmm. and they add up. Thanks, Dean. I will say mostly simple things, hopefully logical <laughs> ones as well, but we'll find out. Um, so uh, thank you all. Um, we'll turn now to the Q&A portion of the discussion. Please submit your questions about environmental leadership, um, environmental issues, and Nicholas School in the comment box, and we'll do our best to field them. To get us started, I'd like to throw out an initial question to Deb. Uh, Deb, in your view, what's the most wicked environmental issue we will be facing in the coming years? And what might be the most critical step in how we address that issue? Well, first I want to say that I'm from Boston, so I love the word wicked. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to kind of turn it a little bit to to wicked, wicked environmental problems are problems that are super complicated, um, hard to get to get uh, grasp on. Um, but even more than wicked, we have this new class of environmental problems that we call super wicked. So that's where I want to pivot to, I guess. And super wicked pro environmental problems are, are ones that are, are characterized by by three uh, components. And one is that they these problems are are created by the very people that we're asking to solve them. So that makes them difficult. Mm. They're also, we're also running out of time to address them, and that's 
critical. And then the third thing is we really don't know what kind of institutions we need to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. The one we think of most often is climate change. We, we, you know, with climate change, we, we're running out of time for sure. Uh, we also know that we created climate change, and we're also going to have to solve it. And then finally, we're, we're just trying to figure out what kinds of global institutions, as well as local, regional, and, and uh, country-level institutions we're going to have to create to solve these problems. But um, even more than climate change, I think, right now, there's a class of environmental problems that sort of originate in climate change that I think we lose track of by focusing so squarely on climate change. And by that, I think a couple of the top issues that, that I always think about are the loss of biodiversity, mm -hmm. which originates um, in climate change, um, uh, problems with access to clean water is another. And then finally, uh, a third that I, I like for us to consider is the rise of environmental inequality and the mm -hmm. uh, you know, inability for some, a large number of people across, across the planet to be uh, given an opportunity for experiencing environmental justice. Mm -hmm. So what do we do to address these problems? There's a, a lot of things that we have to do, but I guess the first thing I would say is that um, we need to get together. Environmental leadership is a collaborative process. We're going to need to engage in collective action. We need to create followers that go along with leaders to work together to address the issues and really have an influence on our institutions both, both globally and uh, nationally and subnationally. And I, um, and, and I guess uh, another thing worth saying too in light of uh, especially what's going on in our country is that we really need to protect our integrity as scientists. We need to respect and honor science as we come up with solutions to these problems. Thanks, Deb. Uh, anyone would like to add to what Deb has said? I'll, sure, I'll jump in. Um, I'll, I'll take it kind of to a really local level. I think that the wicked problem that I think water people are grappling with, you know, we've, we've looked at big things like what will how will climate change affect snowpack and how is the West going to get water and all, obviously those are big issues, but there's something just so simple about um, the way a colleague of mine captured it of no more flints. Um, the fact that Flint, Michigan happened and the, the decisions that led to that, the, uh, the fact that we have depopulating cities in areas of the United States and so it gets into this issue of environmental justice um, and not only was there a lack of leadership, but there was also the misuse of leadership that led to that. And I think that there's just, uh, you know, we can look globally and we can see the loss of tropical species and lots of other things, but I think one thing that a lot of us here at, at Duke are really concerned about is these very local environmental tragedies that happen that can be, you know, Flint kind of happened and then we kind of forgot about it for a while. And it's a really devastating example of what happens when we have a lack of leadership for environmental problems. Great, thanks Mark. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm very focused on community level processes and um, solving issues at the community level, so I bring that uh, perspective and bias to my answer. But I really do agree that I think um, a lot of the wicked problems that we face, it, it needs to be addressed at multiple scales and multiple levels. Um, you know, you can't... Um, you can't solve climate change just by working at the UN. You have to work at that level. And you can't solve climate change just by working um, at the federal level. Um, there, have to be, there have to be local level actions as well, and leadership, really strong leadership. Um, you know, should the city of Chicago has to come together to develop a climate action plan. That's a really necessary component of, um, of working at the level of cities and municipalities to think about how we're going to be mitigating climate change and responding to it. Um, but it also requires local level actions as well. So I think um, just to reinforce what Deb and both Deb and Martin were saying, um, these solutions need to happen and leadership, good leadership, not like we had in Flint, need to happen at multiple scales as well. Thanks, Liz. Why don't we move on? Um, Dean, I'm wondering if you might want to take a stab at this next one, get us going. Um, there's often uncertainty associated with environmental issues. Um, how do we lead in light of uncertainty? You know, I was just, I was thinking about smoking just now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no Not smoking about taking, yeah, about taking. <laughs> <laughs> So I think about uncertainty 
And, and evidence, I guess, is the way that I think about this. And this is to be about climate change again, of course. So climate change is, is fraught with uncertainty. We're making projections about things that are in a pretty distant future, about mm -hmm. some things that are pretty complicated as processes. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I think about that, I think about smoking and the link between smoking and, and lung cancer. And it's actually not a bad metaphor. So mm -hmm. we're about as sure right now at, that human activities cause climate change as we are that smoking causes lung cancer. Statistically, they're kind of similar problems. Uh, they're also similar in, in that if you smoke, you might not get lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And if you don't smoke, you might get lung cancer. <laughs> and so that's, that's just part of the, that's kind of part of statistics. And so we need mm -hmm. to sort of remember that that's part of the game. So climate change is associated with increasing frequencies of floods and droughts. Does that mean if we have a flood or a drought, it was caused by climate change? Not that one, not that event, but yeah, it is consistent with what we expect as a pattern. So, so I think, like reminding ourselves to talk about uncertainty, mm -hmm. the way we understand uncertainty is liberating because, again, if you think about smoking, it's not hard to make the case that you probably shouldn't smoke. It's not good for you. Right? Okay. Can I no. So, if, you know, actually that, that brings me back to something that you had said earlier, too, about um, communicating um, the, necess the necessity of um, simplifying your message when you're trying to communicate with a public audience, especially at a local level. Um, actually, not just at a local level, at all levels. Um, we're actually facing right now a challenge in the Deep Superfund uh, <coughs> Research Center. Um, we're working on a project trying to map out um, potential risk associated with um, soil contamination in community gardens. and we're struggling to try and think about how to communicate that risk. Um, because you don't want to overstate your case, right? Because that will scare people. Um, and you don't want to understate the case because then people won't act. So knowing, I, I really appreciate what you said earlier about um, knowing how, how much to simplify, what elements of the message are key um, to get people to understand the issue and to act, but, um, but doing so in a way that um, that is understandable, clear, and promotes action um, and not panic is also important. <laughs> so communication, I think, is key as well. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about how we try to uh, develop those skills in our students. Mm. Mm -hmm. How do we, so, <laughs> you are most welcome. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's uncertainty associated with a lot of these issues. There are complicated issues. Um, our students have to be able to understand mm -hmm. how to, you know, firstly understand the, uh, the uncertainty of there, how to uh, think about um, mm -hmm. devising solutions in light of that, and that's gonna uh, require interacting with other folks. Um, you know, ultimately, it, it may be a community group, it may be mm -hmm. um, a, uh, you know, in, in a political organization, a, a company. Um, how, how do we work toward uh, developing those skills for well, our students? Well, I think one of, the, one of the things that we all try to do, and I imagine all of us do in our, in our classroom too, is to um, really impart a, a sort of a series of skills in a toolkit mm -hmm. for our students to, to both think about uncertainty, to, to recognize it, to put bounds around it, to, to somehow communicate uncertainty in all of the challenges that, that we're trying to help them face. Um, but, but really, I, I sort of agree a lot with what you were saying, Liz, is that um, communication is a, is a really critical um, component of what we do for help our students with, and communicating both in writing and in mm -hmm. speaking and visually. Uh, students are, are increasingly really better than a lot of us at creating <laughs> visual depictions of uncertainty, and I think, and other, other sorts of issues, and I think that's, that's critically important. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think also the opportunities that our students have to get practical experiences mm -hmm. yes. in real world organizations. Yeah. Right? Um, mm -hmm. We have wonderful internship programs here, uh, the, the Stand Back uh, um, Internships uh, uh, program being a, a kind of a lead example, but many others besides mm -hmm. that. And so students have the opportunity to get out and, and work mm -hmm. um, with actual organizations, uh, nonprofit or governmental. Um, private sector, and, and then uh, the work they do on, on their projects, uh, which may be in the context of certificate programs, mm -hmm. like our yeah. uh, certificate in community-based environmental management, which I think is going to be more and more important in, in years ahead, given uh, uh, the uh, this shift of emphasis toward uh, uh, local uh, mm -hmm. community uh, state level, which mm -hmm. I, I think we're, you know, we're going to be seeing. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then the master's projects that they do, you know, to have an actual client and 
you know, they have, have to interact with those working professionals and, and be part of the, mm -hmm. uh, the team within that organization. Sorry, anything to add? Uh, just, it, it's, I think the trick with being a leader or, you know, when we think about what is a leader, it's always going to be hard to define, right? You know, when we see it. Um, but there's this necessity in environmental leadership to be able to go from digging way down into the weedy details yeah. and then toggling back into this very broad mega trend kind of context. Yeah. And I think that that's, um, if I've seen anything from the, from the students who come in and just kind of vault right in and they, they understand their role and they understand how to implement change, it's also a willingness and an ability to not just try to take leadership on but instead, actually, there are times where you actually have to dig into the details, and that's where you know, the technical skill sets that, we, uh, that all of us try to put into our students, but especially in some of the super wonky classes that Dean Urban and others teach, um, that just pummels them into submission of statistics. Um, that's a skill set that actually comes in super valuable down the road when you just don't think you're gonna need it, and it actually, it's a toolkit that you just have to have down the road. Sorry, Dean. So since you mentioned it, I will, uh, point out that my super nerdy multi period stats classes are actually writing classes. Mm -hmm. What students learn how to do in those classes is to do really complicated stuff and present it to their peers in mm -hmm. plain English in a way that makes it sound perfectly simple. <laughs> actually, just to give one quick example too, I know we want to move on, but um, I thought I'd give an example of a project, um, a project-based learning that I think exemplifies that. Um, a master's project that I was involved in actually uh, was uh, working with a, a local coffee roaster, uh, Counterculture Coffee, and uh, we were, I was working with, um, I think it's now a total of 10 students to um, work with coffee cooperatives in Latin America, and we got into the weeds, um, both in terms of um, asking, the primary question was looking at how climate change is impacting uh, coffee, smallholder coffee producers in Latin America and how they're adapting. Um, we got into all sorts of details and uh, data gathering and analysis, but then the end product had to be communicated in ways that were relevant and were understandable and actionable to a coffee roasting company in Durham, North Carolina, and to smallholder coffee cooperatives in Guatemala, Peru, and Colombia. So it really, those kind of experiences, and that's not unusual, <laughs> those kind of experiences really teach students you know, give them practical experience and communi communicating clearly and in ways that are going to produce action. And at, at the end of the day, Liz, I, I think you'd agree that it's not just having the those raw, or not raw, the polished communication skills yeah. that you can, you know how to deliver the mm -hmm. message, but it's also that relationship that's built, been built up, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, yeah. you know, I see that especially in the students who will do an, an internship over the summer, which then develops into their master's mm -hmm. project, and they may have you know, it, it, it's uh, almost a year uh, mm -hmm. where they're interacting with an organization, mm -hmm. and so by the time it comes to the delivery of the, the final product, there's already that relationship built, yeah. and so the um, you know the, the, the stage is set uh, mm -hmm. to, to deliver that product and have it be well received. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's uh, an important part of leadership is knowing how to engage uh, with other people. As, mm -hmm. as someone said, yeah, earlier, it's it's you know, it's not only about knowing the science, but we also have to know, you know how to interact with other people and other organizations. Okay, uh, we have a, uh, a question from um, the audience, uh, online audience, uh, this is from Trevor, and so Trevor asks, with increased global temperatures and sea levels, how should we address the growing impact on our critical maritime transportation systems in a way that balances environmental and economic impact? So who here works on maritime <laughs> transportation systems? So I, I'm, I'm an economist, okay? Um, I don't work on maritime transportation systems. Um, I can take a, a stab at this. I can start, but others please, uh, please uh, uh, join in. Um, so so what, maybe say a little bit about you know, how I became an economist. So I, mm -hmm. I actually started off um, doing natural science work. Uh, related to tropical trees and tropical forests, which I enjoyed very much. Uh, but the first time I went to the tropics was a, a trip to Costa Rica, a collecting expedition for the botanist mm -hmm. I was working for. And I hadn't really seen you know, deforestation occurring mm -hmm. before my eyes before. And, and uh, I started wondering, you know, why is this happening, what we can do about it. And I, I stumbled across economics and I found it to be a very useful way to actually understand these, uh, these trade-offs and kind of 
in the questionnaire, the way it's, it's phrased is balancing the environmental and economic impact. And as an environmental economist, I, I think it's, it's not so much economics against the environment that there's one is you know, on the one side and the other on, on the other side. But rather, um, you know, environmental changes have a complicated set of effects um, mm -hmm. on humans and the other life forms that we uh, share the planet with. And, and to me, economics really helps us understand what those different effects mm -hmm. are. And, and so the broad answer I would give to this is uh, we need to have a careful economic analysis so that we mm -hmm. know what the benefits and costs are and how they're distributed among different groups. Mm -hmm. you know, very often with the environment, the impacts are, um, uh, uh, you know, of, or the, uh, the benefits of improving the environment are very widely spread mm -hmm. across a bunch, but the costs of taking environmental action are very concentrated, and that makes the politics really difficult when you've got mm -hmm. one group bearing a large portion of the cost. The benefits are kind of you know, spread across everyone. They're, they're bigger than the cost, but it's, uh, you know, they're not so, so obvious. And so the, the economics can, try, can help to bring that out. Um, but it's got to be built on strong science foundations, and so you know that's in the question here as well. You know we have to have a good understanding of how climate change is going to affect sea levels and how uh, that's going to um, affect ecosystems along the coasts, um, human populations. Um, so this is not a very direct uh, answer to your question, Trevor, in terms of what the uh, what the policy approach should be. But my broad answer is uh, we need the rigorous um, uh, what I would say economic analysis in terms of what I can do more generally would be the social science analysis. And that has to be built on really solid environmental foundations. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe there's someone here who can talk more directly <laughs> so about the maritime transportation yeah, system. I can't, talk, I can't talk about maritime maritime, but I can talk about inland maritime. Um, I think that the, look, we've, we've fundamentally underinvested in the nation's infrastructure, mm -hmm. period. Um, and the ports and harbors are one of the areas that we like to ignore, but they, a lot of our stuff comes from overseas, and we export an obscene quantity of agricultural products overseas. So ports, inland harbor, any kind of a harbor is going to be critically important to our economy. Um, more broadly, though, I think that this question raises the fact that uh, you could insert almost anything into this. Global temperature, sea level rise, global temperature rising is also going to affect snowpack, which is going to affect the utility of uh, water infrastructure in the western United States. So to me, what this also raises is how are we going to pay for the basic infrastructure costs that are associated with climate change? Mm -hmm. and, and that scales both to maritime infrastructure, which I think is deeply underappreciated in the United States, and also scales to water in the west. And so this is one of the things where we used to fund a lot of infrastructure systems by federal appropriations. And in case somebody hasn't noticed, Congress doesn't like to appropriate funding very much anymore. Um, and so those costs, similar to the, the conversation we've been having, it seems like the whole time, those costs are being borne by local communities. At most the state, more likely mm -hmm. by local cities and towns and port authorities. And because of that, again, the decision making, the locus of decision making, is, as, as much as we like to say that it's at the federal government, the locus of decision-making leadership still keeps coming back to local communities, and that applies for finance as well. Port authorities are going to have to, you know, figure out a way to finance the deepening and the expansion of their ports to be globally competitive and respond to climate change. It still gets back to local leadership more so than federal leadership. Hmm. I'm going to wait and actually uh, address Trevor's question kind of directly. <laughs> So we have uh, people at the Marine Lab here well, in Beaufort here who have, are working on, on this issue pretty hard right now. So Pat Halpin and Andy Reid and others. Mm -hmm. um, and so one way to think about this problem is to think about environmental or ecological value of a, of a location on the mm -hmm. ground on the scale from like zero to one or something. Not mm -hmm. very good to really good. And economic value on the same scale. And you can map both of those. So, so our Marine Lab people have maps of ocean biodiversity for the mm -hmm. Atlantic Ocean and they're built on an enormous amount of data. They're actually quite good. Um, and you can make a map of environmental impact that would look like shipping lanes because that's kind of where they put them is where they're most economically efficient to be or where they most need to be. If you can make a map of those places and, there's, and you kind of score those as you know, a location could be not very good ecologically and not very valuable economically, in which case it's also not very interesting to us. Mm. Um, there could be places that are valuable for economics and for for ecology, and those are areas where there's a lot of conflict, and that's where the, you know, the politics of, of trade-offs and all of that <coughs> comes into play. Hmm. But you also have the capacity to identify places that are ecologically good and not very interesting uh, 
in terms of the economics and, and vice. You can find places where there isn't any conflict, and those are win-win situations. And, and it's not completely infeasible to pursue this kind of a, of a problem by asking where are the win-win situations? Are there places mm -hmm. where we can actually make everybody mm -hmm. happy? And that's not the way we have typically gone after this problem. We typically go after it by pitting you know, environmentalists against the other guys, but um, it doesn't have to work that way. And that, that solution approach is the same as, as what we do in land management if you're trying to develop a landscape and minimize water quality, that the solution is really where can we do development and protect water quality. It's not don't develop because it's bad for water. I mean, you have to find the places where you can do it and, and minimize the impacts. Great, thanks. Um, why don't we move on? So uh, we have another question. Uh, this one uh, is, is very much um, of the moment. Uh, given recent nominations by President Trump to lead key positions in his administration, US EPA, Secretary of State, and DOI, Department of Interior, uh, DOE, Department of Energy, how can environmentalists affect change and advance the environmental agenda? <laughs> because in, in, um, in my class today, I was teaching a sustainable business strategy where we, we really focus on uh, helping business, helping students um, acquire tools to work in private sector um, positions to advance the environmental agenda mm -hmm. for businesses. And I noticed that the students were feeling particularly anxious and sad today in light of all of the things that are going on. And so I s sort of took temperature of the room and said, how are we feeling and um, what, what can we do? Mm -hmm. And we, we did a little bit of brainstorming about what we could do. And what we came up with is that we can, you know, sort of, again, it's collaboration and it's um, lending our voice and lending our, our experience and our expertise to the conversations that are going on to just mm -hmm. uh, again honor the the importance of science, but also to to sort of bind together with uh, students and others that are interested in advancing the agenda through public policy, mm -hmm. through the actions of the private sector, and partnering with and with uh, environmental uh, non government organizations mm -hmm. to uh, keep our voices heard, and also to if if uh, if there's going to be we talked about this at the beginning too. The, environmental leadership has to happen at all levels. If there's not going to be leadership at the federal level, we have lots of opportunities to um, enact leadership at, in, in our communities and at the, at the state level and at um, levels beyond the, the federal level here in the United States. We also had, I also was fortunate to have a broad variety of students from different countries in the room mm -hmm. and we talked about how we might build bridges between countries and think about how we could we could all work together to come up with common solutions and, and lend our voices. So I think those are some of the, the ways that I would recommend. Yeah, I actually just came from teaching a class. I, we have a nice bunch of classes, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I occupied the class right after hers was finished. But the class is actually, um, it's a practicum in community-based environmental management. Um, so it's actually our, our mostly our certificate students who are doing um, work, really grounded work um, with community-based organizations throughout North Carolina. And they were talking, actually we had a check-in this, this uh, before class as well, and they just received their assignments um, for projects that they will do with community-based organizations throughout North Carolina. And I think what really hit me, um, because I was also feeling fairly down about uh, the recent news coming from the federal government, um, and they were as well, that um, they all said that um, they felt incredibly heartened to be able to, and empowered to be able to um, make these direct connections at this point with people working at the community level for real substantial environmental and social change. Um, and I think that that's, again, I have a bias <laughs> about working at, with communities for social and environmental change, but I really do feel, um, and I can see it every single day in the work that we do here, the work that our students do, the work that our community partners do, that that is incredibly powerful. So I really do believe that um, working, uh, acting collectively and fomenting collective action uh, for environmental change at the local level is uh, a powerful force in the universe. So that's, that's my response. <laughs> so Martin. Uh, you just returned from a year in Washington. Uh, you were <laughs> yes. inside the Department of Interior. Uh, I imagine you have some views on this question. 
Yeah. Um, so I had the opportunity to spend a year in D.C. working for, uh, in the Secretary's hallway at the Department of Interior, working for De uh, Deputy Secretary Mike Connor, who I came to admire deeply as, a, as an amazing environmental leader. Um, and I think the lesson that I got as uh, in the last month or so from both Secretary Jewell and Deputy Secretary Connor was to give the new administration a chance. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of rhetoric and we kind of need to, you know, mm -hmm. out of deference to the office of the presidency, there needs to be some, some chance to do that. Um, the incoming secretary, the, the one, Ryan Zinke, is being, he's being proposed to be Secretary of Interior. Um, he's, uh, you know, seems to be a public lands advocate, uh, very supportive mm -hmm. of public lands in the West, and so that's something that I personally feel strongly about as well. Um, there's, there, there are different issues that are going to be very important. I think public lands and the opening up of public lands for oil and gas development is going to be a very uh, salient issue. The effect of those developments on uh, species habitat is going to be front and center, I think, in the first six months. That's just going to be, that, that's, I think, where, for lack of a better term, the battle, battle lines are going to be drawn. Um, water tends to, we like to fall through the cracks, so people don't, you know, they, they like their drinking water, so I think we're going to, you know, water's just going to be kind of marginalized um, to a degree. Um, but the, you know, I, I'm going to just keep pounding the same drum, so I apologize for that, but I still think a lot of this gets back to, to local issues, you know, echoing, mm -hmm. I think, what you said, Liz, which is, um, you know, I think about my kids' public health is far more likely to be impacted by the decisions of my mayor than it is by the decisions of a president. Um, he's going to set the trajectory for a period of time, um, but in reality, we are deeply affected by our local leaders and we are marginally affected by our federal leaders. Um, and so we don't know what this president's going to do yet. I think that's, you know, there were a lot of things about the Obama administration that I thought fell, fell short. Um, and I think that that's fair in the same way that I hope some of the current administration's uh, goals potentially fall, fall, fall short. What we don't do is hold our local leaders, local environmental leaders' feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, to be honest, I'm not sure who our current governor has nominated to be Secretary of Environment for North Carolina. <laughs> um, and I find it a little bit ironic that I know, don't know that, but I do know who the federal secretary mm -hmm. might be. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, where, where I've ended up after mm -hmm. a year. Want I want to say one more thing too, and, and I, I don't want to uh, miss uh, taking the opportunity to say, to talk a little bit about the private sector because mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of really good news about the private sector. One thing uh, that private sector environmental leaders will do is they have sort of a long view and they take mm -hmm. uh, the regulatory environment that's given to them and they make plans to, to drive competitive advantage from it. And also, more and more env environmental leaders in the private sector are operating from a position of conscience and a position of really wanting to be an environmental leader. They're not going to stop that mm -hmm. because we have different appointees at the federal level. It's just mm -hmm. not going to stop. Uh, they're not going to turn around and you know, do a 180 and then become, you know, <coughs> make uh, products in a in a dirty way with lots of waste and lots of air pollution. Mm -hmm. So I think we can take you know some solace in the fact that they're going to move ahead in, in, the, in the trajectory that they've been going on together. There's a lot of support in the private sector for leaders that are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. and, but they're also making, um, they're taking a competitive advantage from doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Well, how about if we move on? Um, we have another question here. Uh, can you, that is us, uh, <laughs> talk about adaptive leadership and how important it is in addressing environmental issues? Adaptive leadership. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like adaptive management. You know something about that, Dean, so well, let's get it started. It's kind of semantics. So as Jeff notes, laughing at me, that uh, I have taught adaptive management here and, and actually tried to take this to a local land trust uh, that I work with very closely, the Triangle Land Conservancy. Um, at a time when we were thinking of bringing in leaders of agencies like that to take coursework here in adaptive mm -hmm. management, and his response was, yeah, Dean, we, we don't do that. <laughs> um, and it's true, they don't like follow the rules of you know, doing that, the whole rubric, but uh, what they do do is they make decisions that are very much contingent on context and timing, and that's kind of adaptive leadership. You know, They're given a playing field and a position in it, and they do what they need to do to do what's best for their organization, for their organization's mission. And you can label that any way you want, but that's 
uh, I think that's how leaders lead is by being adaptive. It's hard to imagine what, what the opposite of that would be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And we are talking about uncertainty earlier, mm -hmm. addressing uncertainty. This yeah. is a, a critical way that it's done, right? You don't just set a plan and, and stick to it slavishly no matter where mm -hmm. it leads you, but you, you respond to how things are changing and, and, and you adapt. I wonder if that's going to be a test that we'll see. I'm actually pretty struck by what Deb just said because if environmental, if the private sector doesn't do a hard pivot over the next four <coughs> years or in any setting in which they could potentially take a more environmentally destructive approach, so that indicates to me that there's been a very significant mindset change from the private sector. That this is, that it's not just in response to environmental compliance, but it's also just better business. Um, and I, I wonder if that's just a victory that we don't trumpet enough. That you know, this has been something that we've been going after for 40 years, 50 years, and it's it kind of has worked. I mean, this is better business practice in a lot of ways. Just because you can be more polluting in your particular industry doesn't mean that it's better to do so mm -hmm. for your own business to do so. Well, and, and a lot of the um, improvements in environmental performance are now baked into the technology, right, in, in, into the, the capital stock. And so things are designed in a way to be more energy efficient and, and to uh, release less pollution. And so it's not as if you'll throw out that current, you know, modern factory you have and, and uh, set up a, you know, a, a steel mill or a, a refinery of, you know, the sort that we had 40, 50 years ago. Uh, that technology is not coming back. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the, um, we had the, the, the question about, um, the appointments in Washington, again, I, I don't really work in the U.S., except when I'm dean. You know, when I'm teaching, <laughs> um, I try to work here, but my, when I'm doing my research, I'm, I'm abroad. And, you know, when I started off in this line of work back in the 1980s, um, government officials in all the countries mm, I yeah. was working in were not at all concerned about the environment. Right. Um, this was the kind of the adolescent stage of the Asian miracle, I guess, and these economies were really taking off, and there was a great desire to fight poverty and to, and to create jobs. Mm -hmm. um, yet, you know, during that time and since, there's been great environmental progress. And you know, how did that happen, despite the fact that there were leaders of um, you know, government agencies who were not very sensitive to the concerns? A lot of it was at the community level, as, mm -hmm. as has been said already. And um, uh, grassroots environmental organizations, mm -hmm. also national environmental organizations that that managed to identify the political leaders who did want to make uh, progress. You know, governments are not monoliths. They're, they're made up of lots of different people. Not everybody thinks the, the same way. It was companies, again, and, and you know, for, at that time, uh, you know, multinational companies were really slammed as being the bad uh, uh, folks when it came to environmental performance, but they were often a source of new technology coming into these countries, and, and they faced pressures in the international marketplace, the, the, the markets that were selling products, Europe and North America, to to perform better, and you know, you don't want to invest in a place with really dirty air or dirty water. Uh, just it, it doesn't add to your bottom line. If, if you're in the, the food or beverage industry and, and the rivers are really polluted, you have to pay more to, to make your product. So, you know, corporate uh, pressures uh, were really important, um, and you know, democratic institutions. And so, you know, there there are elections, and there are elections at all levels, and that provides a way for signals to be sent. And uh, you know, politicians may have particular views, but in you know, certain ways they are followers themselves. If they want to stay in office, then they have to, you know, do what people want. And if you make some promises you don't keep them, or what you're you know, promising to do doesn't turn out the way that you said it would, then uh, there will be a response. So there, there are some of these, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these pressures that can be applied very effectively, even in places where it would appear that the top leadership is not supportive of environmental action. Okay, um, what do the next generation of environmental leaders look like? Um, what attributes, skills, training are required of these leaders? Okay, so this is the business we're in, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, who wants to take a stab at this one? I just talk, so it's, it's not like... Well, I think they look like the people that are on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. They look exactly like those people. You agree on well, I, I can take one step at it, and I think um, maybe I'll talk less about the attributes and skills that they need or they're required, but I, I think that um, the next generation of environmental leaders look a lot like America looks like. Um, one thing that we are really focused on here at the Nicholas School is um, trying to, um, 
broaden the um, diversity of our student body and um, really attempting to ensure that um, the people who are the next generation of leaders in our country um, and actually around the world because we, we bring in uh, students from all over the world um, really looks like America looks like, really looks like the world looks like, um, that we have a broad representation of um, students from different economic, uh, socioeconomic, different uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds, um, different cultural backgrounds as well. Um, and really, I think one of the things that's going to be incredibly important as we move forward um, and is really necessary for developing effective leadership is bringing in people who have experiences and backgrounds and perspectives that are, um, are diverse because we need a really diverse set of tools and perspectives and outlooks um, to find really diverse solutions to uh, these wicked problems that we're facing. So um, we are very much focused on that here, and I, um, yeah, I, that's what that future looks like, I think. And, and even to recognize that some problems exist, yeah. right? And so, yeah, um, that's really true, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Flint, the problem there didn't happen in, mm -hmm. um, La Jolla, California, where we used to live, right? right? And so um, um, if we don't have a diverse set of the population that is um, engaged in environmental work, we're going to miss out on a bunch of really important problems. Yeah, that are effect really impacting a lot of people, yeah. But I'm going to echo something that uh, both Deb said earlier, and I think Dean might have said it as well. I mean, it's really ironic. Um, one of the attributes of leaders is that they follow. Um, mm -hmm. David Brooks had a great column in the New York Times not too long ago on how America needs more followers, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that part of uh, part of leading initiatives is having people who will implement the vision. And mm -hmm. you know, in the end, everybody is a follower. So I'm an academic, so I have you know ultimate freedom. Except I also have a dean, um, and so <laughs> uh, and then the dean has a provost, and on and on it goes. And then at, the, at a certain level, the provost is then responsive to the people who enroll in the university. The same thing, the president is responsible to the constituents. So th there needs to be, what, what I'm kind of looking for, it sounds like, is, an in, is a, a leader as an independent follower, somebody who mm -hmm. can, 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 can grab onto a vision and then implement that vision very independently. Mm -hmm. um, and it, there is this kind of contrast in what you're looking for. So they need skill sets. They need mm -hmm. an, avi an ability to not say, this is how we're going to change the world, but work with people to come up with that vision and then be able to break it down into its component parts and implement each one of those component parts as we go along. Mm -hmm. I think we, a lot of times we think of leaders, we think about people who set the vision and the vast majority of times what we actually need is people who can implement a vision that's already there. And I was just thinking about, this is going to be picking up threads earlier, from earlier, but thinking about the difference, just the semantic difference between policy and, and Decision making. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and this comes back to the, that drum we've been beating all along about uh, acting locally. And this, agencies have mandates and they have policies that guide what they can do, and that and that and that is guidance. They have kind mm -hmm. of constraints in which they act, but they don't. Agencies don't make decisions. Individuals make decisions, and, and usually in a very local context. Mm -hmm. And for most, well, actually, for I think most federal agencies, or all of them now, at least on paper do that with the stakeholder engagement phase of decision making that they have to do because it's their policy. Which means when those decisions get made, it's it's lots of people sitting around to decide what they should do very locally given the context of that decision. And that's that's really promising. And and those people's are those are the leaders. They're the ones that make the decisions. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we have another question uh, from a viewer. Uh, this one is as emerging markets continue to develop and demand more energy and more energy at affordable price points, how do we mitigate this increased demand's impact on climate change globally? From your perspective, are global leaders, particularly in these emerging markets, receptive to dialogue around sustainable growth strategy? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> again, let, Great yeah, question. Yeah. I could start on this, but if someone yeah, else wants to. Yeah. Okay, and, and it looks like this will be the last question as we're bumping up against our, our time constraint. So, um, kind of gets back to some of what I was, I was talking about earlier, um, that uh, as we look at environmental problems in developing countries where, where I work, it's, it's important to look at them not as uh, a trade-off between the environment and mm -hmm. the economy, okay? Mm -hmm. um, environmental degradation does damage, right? Uh, dirty air um, causes premature deaths. 
Um, you know, it's, uh, it reduces um, cognitive ability in, in infants um, and, and children and you know, adults as, as they grow up. Uh, clean water, dirty water, as I mentioned before, has economic costs. Um, you know, loss of forests um, has significant costs, uh, increasing soil erosion, um, leading to sedimentations of, of rivers, of, of reservoirs, increased flooding. Uh, so there's a lot of damage that's, that's done. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, coming back uh, more directly uh, to this, uh, uh, this question is to uh, really make sure there's good understanding of what uh, uh, not only the, the, the costs of moving to more um, uh, uh, environmentally friendly forms of energy are, but what kind of benefits come, come from that? And if you look only at the cost side, that energy may be more expensive, then you miss out you know, why you're doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing that because we have a healthier population, um, mm -hmm. uh, and we have uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, healthier industries, we have more job growth, there are lots of benefits that are, mm -hmm. that are generated. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's, uh, we have growing population, we have growing economies, um, but there are you know, ways to shift away from the most polluting fuels, and movement in that direction is going to be stronger if we you know, recognize better that there are benefits to, uh, to doing that. And so my plea would be not to view the environment and the economy as separate mm -hmm. things. Uh, we only have you know, one if we give up the other, but rather uh, there is the possibility of win-win. And I, I don't want to overstate that. I mean, there will be trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. You can't always have, have everything, but um, given the, uh, uh, the degree of uh, pollution, that the extent to which we're pumping uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty far from that point where um, the uh, uh, cost of taking action on climate change are going to be less than the benefits. Mm -hmm. And I would say, too, that we have, you know, we have examples of, um, in, in emerging markets, which, which uh, leaders, environmental leaders, have learned how to do that balancing mm -hmm. and, and the benefits of doing that kind of balancing. And one of the things that all of us as environmental leaders need to do is to tell those stories, mm -hmm. be, being storytellers. When, you know, mm -hmm. we, we have our hands around the science and the policy, but we also need to cultivate our, our ability to tell stories and to, to listen to others and communicate so that we can really understand where these success stories are and how to replicate them. Yeah, I'm not optimistic on this one. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, I look back on our own history and, I mean, the deep south where I'm from was a developing country in the 1930s. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the pictures are kids without shoes and there was no running water, there was no electricity until the TBA in a lot of the Deep South. Um, and I don't begrudge developing countries at all for wanting to have electricity, um, mm -hmm. and they should. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think that we should um, underestimate the effect of fracking on releasing mm -hmm. unbelievable quantities of energy on the world, which is mm -hmm. going to be transformative. Um, I think that the only way to get around some of the problems that this question raises is we need an equally large transformation of renewable energy. Um, but I think that we, we can get around, work around the margins to a certain degree, but we need a fundamental transformation in the energy economy in order to get at some of the problems that developing countries have. Yeah. I, I'd agree with that, Martin, uh, but I, I think we're more likely to get to that point if it's better understood that there's a reason why we're doing it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That there are benefits that come from that we're not talking about uh, you know, the prospect of climate change happening. It, it's happening already, mm -hmm. and that there's damage being uh, caused by that. Um, and yes, then it, it, from that point, uh, it's a matter of getting policies and, and the incentives in place, and you know, ones that will shift us toward a more uh, renewable economy. I'm getting the sign that we're supposed to wrap up. Um, <laughs> so um, I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Um, uh, in, we enjoyed your questions. I uh, hope you enjoyed our answers and, and learned something uh, from this. Um, if you'd like to uh, find out more about us, uh, feel, please feel free to contact us. And I'm sure that there's information that is available um, through the interface you're using. Uh, so you can find out how to reach us. Um, um, and so um, we've enjoyed it very much. And thank you for your time. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Goodbye.